A young girl frantically wound in and out of the large stone statues of ancient Egyptian kings and queens. She stopped to kiss their feet and called them my people in a heavy Egyptian accent, scolding passers-by for not removing their shoes in the presence of the gods. The scene was proving to be a little awkward for her parents, as the girl was British-born, four-year-old Dorothy Eady, the statues were in the British Museum and the year was 1908. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Dorothy Eady was born in Blackheath in London, England in 1904 to a relatively modest but comfortable family. Her father, Reuben Ernest Eady, worked as a master tailor, whilst her mother, Caroline Mary Eady, stayed at home to look after Dorothy. They lived an unremarkable and peaceful few years. It was the turn of the new century and they were able to enjoy all the comforts of Edwardian life in a prosperous Britain. At the age of three, disaster struck, however, when Dorothy tripped and fell down a full flight of stairs whilst playing at home. The doctor was called to the scene and after testing for vital signs via placing a mirror and feather by her mouth, there was no hope as far as he could see and he pronounced Dorothy dead. Her parents were distraught as the doctor carried her to bed and laid her down before returning to his surgery to enlist the aid of a nurse to prepare Dorothy's body to be taken to the funeral home. Upon his return an hour later, however, much to his shock as he walked into Dorothy's room, he found the young girl perfectly alive. She was sitting up in bed and playing, chirping happily away to herself, and upon inspection appeared to have suffered no real injury. Dorothy's parents, disturbed by the chain of events, chased the doctor out of the house, all the while knocking back his concerned protestations that to the best of his knowledge, the girl had most certainly been dead when he had last seen her. As strange as this situation was, this was just the start of a series of strange events concerning their young daughter. Shortly after the accident, Dorothy began breaking down into tears. She would sit hidden under the dining table and cry to herself for hours. When asked what was wrong, she would tell her parents simply, I want to go home. Despite telling her over and over again that she already was home, her behaviour went on. All the while, Dorothy insisted, despite her parents' efforts to comfort her. On one occasion, her mother finally decided to ask, Dorothy, if this is not our home, where is? To which Dorothy replied, I don't know, but I want to go there. It was also during this period of her young childhood that Dorothy began having recurring dreams of a large building, with vast stone columns and wide open gardens. A lotus pool sat nestled among exotic jasmine, oleander, mimosa, dwarf chrysanthemums and mandrakes. Dorothy did not recognise any of these details at the time, however, only that the dream would come night after night. At times, Dorothy unsettled her parents when she spoke with a heavy accent foreign to her own, slipping in and out seemingly unaware to Dorothy herself. This was dangerous territory for anyone where trips to mental asylums or workhouses had been an easy answer for troubled children. But at only three years old, Dorothy was fortunate to be too young and her parents merely tried to console her when she showed signs of being upset and frustrated. When Dorothy was four years old, her parents, unable to find anyone to look after her, took her along with them on an outing to the British Museum. Dorothy was, as expected by her parents, difficult work in the museum. As any normal young child of four years of age, she showed little signs of interest in the exhibits and towed around behind them as they did their best to keep her amused. As they entered the Egyptian exhibits, however, Dorothy suddenly and, much to her parents' surprise, became wildly enthused at the surrounding works of art. She ran quickly in and out, weaving through the large statues of the Egyptian gods and bent down to kiss their feet. She spoke angrily at other visitors for wearing their shoes in the presence of the gods. Somewhat embarrassed at their child's behaviour, they pulled Dorothy away and as they did so, she spotted a mummy in a display case. Dorothy fell silent immediately, 
walked over to the glass tomb and sat down, refusing to move and staring blankly at the preserved face of the ancient Egyptian. Her mother and father, bemused but at least relieved that their daughter was causing no more commotion, left her alone as she would not respond when they spoke to her and would not budge from the floor in front of the case. Half an hour later, they returned to collect Dorothy and when exasperated at trying to get her to move, her mother scooped her up from the ground. Enraged, Dorothy yelled out, Leave me alone. These are my people. Her mother later stated that her voice was like that of a strange old woman rather than that of a child and was so startled she actually dropped her daughter to the floor. After more commotion, they managed to drag Dorothy away from the museum, kicking and screaming. It was to be, however, another three years before any of the events at the British Museum would begin to make any small amount of sense to the family. In 1911, Dorothy was now seven years old. Originally, her behaviour was thought to be a passing phase, the struggles of raising a small child. However, her peculiar outbursts had remained a constant. One day, whilst passing a bookshop on his way home from work, Reuben stopped in and picked up an edition of The Children's Encyclopedia by Arthur Mee a popular serialised encyclopaedia that ran from 1908 to 1964. In this particular edition, there was an article on the Rosetta Stone which enthralled Dorothy. Her parents commented on how the volume was constantly to be found open at the article and often with a magnifying glass lying next to it which Dorothy used to try to read the writing from the images on the page. When her mother asked her why she was trying to read the etched words, as they were not in English, Dorothy replied, I know it, I've forgotten it, but perhaps I might remember it. Shortly after, Dorothy finally made a discovery that would put an end to years of frustration. Whilst reading a magazine of her father's, Dorothy came across a photograph of the temple of Seti I, an ancient Egyptian temple built for the pharaoh Seti, the son of Ramesses I in Abydos the capital of Upper Egypt, seven miles west of the Nile. From the moment she spotted the picture, a wave of satisfying understanding flooded over her. She quickly sprung up and rushed to tell her parents of her discovery. This, she pointed to the photograph, this is my home. However, things were not quite right in the photo. Dorothy immediately pointed out that the gardens were missing and included details such as the trees and vast lotus gardens that had existed thousands of years before the ruin was rediscovered. The same happened later when she discovered another photograph, this time of Seti himself, mummified but recognisable to Dorothy as a man she had known well. Again, her parents dismissed her insistence in exasperated tones but still Dorothy adamantly told them that she had known him well and he had been a nice and kind man. While still utterly puzzling for her parents, Dorothy at last had an answer as to why she had felt such a draw to Egypt since she was three years old. Her story was still incomplete, but the fog was rising in her mind and she gave herself to learning as much as she could of her homeland. The next few years were no easier for Dorothy. Despite her newly made discovery, she was still acting oddly according to what her parents expected of her. She refused to wear shoes and would walk barefoot at every opportunity, begrudging the times that her parents enforced footwear onto her. At her Sunday school, she told her teacher that Christianity was nothing but a pale imitation of the ancient Egyptian religion, which ended in the first of many home visits from her teachers and pastors over the next several years. She would often visit the Catholic Church because she enjoyed the ceremony of Mass. The traditions of burning incense were something she was particularly fond of. However, when confronted by the priest on whether or not she was in fact a Catholic at all, as he thought he knew her parents, who were in fact Protestants, she explained matter-of-factly that she was not. However, Catholicism reminded her of the old religion and explained once again to an astounded priest the virtues of ancient Egyptian religion. The very next day, the priest wound up visiting her home to lecture her parents on the dangers of Dorothy's philosophies. 
and asked that she be kept away from his church until they had successfully steered her from the path to hell. When she was expelled from her school in Dulwich for throwing a hymn book at a teacher after being scolded for refusing to sing a hymn that included the line, Curse the Swart Egyptians, her parents decided on extreme measures. They sat Dorothy down and threatened her quite gravely that if she continued such behaviours, they would send her away to a convent school in Belgium. Dorothy simply replied that that would be fine and she would simply run away and in fact, it would be easier for her to travel to Egypt from Belgium than from England. This soon put a halt to such ideas from her parents. As she grew older, Dorothy found school tiring and from the age of 10 began to skip classes frequently, instead choosing to spend her time among the Egyptian exhibits in the British Museum. It was here that she met Ernest Wallace Budge, a respected Egyptologist and keeper of Egyptian and Assyrian antiquities at the British Museum. He taught Dorothy how to read ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, setting her phrases from the Book of the Dead to translate, checking them with his own work. Dorothy learned at a pace which surprised Wallace and eventually, after Dorothy had committed several hundred of the pictographs to memory, he asked her how she was able to learn so much so quickly. Dorothy stated simply that, I had known it all before, now it is simply coming back to me. This was an enjoyable period for Dorothy. With every glyph learnt, she felt she was coming one step closer to an understanding that had slipped her grasp for so many years. However, just as she turned 12 years old, shortly after the First World War broke out and bombing raids became more frequent on London, the museum was closed and Dorothy was sent to Sussex to live on her aunt's farm. As headstrong as always, Dorothy rode one of the farm horses eight miles every day to the coastal town of Eastbourne, where she would sit in the library reading everything on Egypt that she could, and once again found peace in the solitude of a life 3,000 years in the past. In 1918, Dorothy returned to London, now aged 14 years old. What happens next is best explained in her own words. One night while sleeping, she experienced an event which would give her the next clue she had waited so long for. I half woke up, feeling a weight on my chest. Then I fully woke up and I saw this face bending over me with both hands on the neck of my nightdress. I recognised the face from the photo I had seen years before of the mummy Seti. I was astonished and shocked and I cried out and yet I was overjoyed. I can remember it as if it was yesterday but still it's difficult to explain. It was the feeling of something you have waited for that has come home at last. After this, Dorothy began having a recurring dream of standing in a dark room thick with the smell of incense as a decorated and stately looking man questioned her aggressively and beat her. She would wake up screaming. Her mother often rushed in to comfort her night after night. The dream meant little to Dorothy, but she knew that it yielded an important part of a memory she had lost and had spent her life so far seeking. Her parents, however, thought very differently of the situation and unsurprisingly for the time, committed her for psychological evaluations at a local mental hospital on several occasions. However, all of her stays were brief and never found any reason for concern. Once Dorothy turned 16, she was no longer enforced by law to attend school. She promptly took this offer and instead intensified a curriculum of self-study on all matters of Egypt that she had previously been following alone for the past several years. Her father, however, was keen to follow his own journey of self-discovery and had recently quit his job as a master tailor to pursue his hunch that moving pictures would be a lucrative business in the coming years. The family took to touring around England and Dorothy would visit the library in every city they stayed in to find new books she hadn't read previously. Eventually they settled in Plymouth, where her father built a large cinema complete with pipe organ. The Edies lived in the flat above the cinema and Dorothy would sing to the pipe organ for the audiences on the nights no films were played. 
As it turned out, Reuben had made an astute observation and the cinema made them a comfortable living, raising them economically. Dorothy had very little love for the cinema, however, and enlisted in art school. As she grew to a young adult, so her philosophies matured and she began investigating the concepts of reincarnation, partaking in a local group dedicated to sharing their own past life stories, as well as several other spiritualist groups. When she recounted the tale of her past, the groups theorised that it was unlikely that she had been reincarnated and were more prone to believe that she had died, falling down the stairs at three years old, and her soul had opened her up to possession, which was surely the true answer to everything that she had experienced of past memories, filtering back to her like sunlight through a dark curtain for so many years. Dorothy thought all of this was pure guff, and so, once again, consoled herself with books and returned to studying alone. And so, the years passed until finally, in 1931, aged 27, Dorothy moved to London against her parents' wishes and took a job writing articles for an Egyptian public relations magazine. This was still a volatile period between Britain and Egypt. Though formerly the British Empire had declared Egyptian independence from the empire in 1922, they still occupied the country and controlled much of the affairs of the Egyptian government. Dorothy wrote articles for the magazine promoting independence for Egypt. Whilst writing for this magazine, she met Imam Abdul Maguid. Though the very next day after their chance meeting, overwatching a session in the House of Commons, Imam returned to Egypt. They continued to correspond regularly, writing letters back and forth for a year, when finally, in 1933, Imam wrote to Dorothy asking for her hand in marriage, which she accepted. Aged 29 years old, Dorothy stepped off the boat in Egypt, knelt down and kissed the ground. She had finally returned home. Unfortunately, Dorothy's marriage to Imam was not as smooth sailing as she had hoped. His family was well off and didn't take kindly to her headstrong attitude towards life. Dorothy, never one to keep the fractured details of her past life secret, also irked them. It was simply not how one should conduct themselves in Egypt as far as they were concerned, and this caused further friction with her new family. Still, she fell pregnant and gave birth to a son named Seti which placated them to a degree. It was not long after her arrival in Egypt that Dorothy would finally come to understand all of her faded memories of her past life in intimate detail. During the night, Dorothy's new husband would frequently awake, only to see Dorothy standing by the writing bureau, frantically scribbling notes onto paper under the moonlight. In later years, Dorothy spoke of these occurrences. Most of the time when I was writing, I was rather unconscious, as though I were under a strange spell, neither asleep nor awake. I was being dictated to. The gentleman who was narrating my story his name was Hora, really took his time. He would tell me just a few words, then be absent for a fortnight or so, then come again, always at night, and relate to me a couple of other lines or episodes, and after that his voice would just die away. It was as though this Hora were bored to death, as if he were fulfilling a mission that filled him with loathing. Every night when he came, I felt as though something was shaking me in order to wake me, just as in a dream. When I was writing the bits and pieces of the story, I felt I was hearing a soft voice without being able to see anybody. When I was being dictated to, I felt as if I could understand every word, but later on when I started to decipher the scribblings, I found that they were quite difficult to understand. In fact, in the mornings when I woke up, everything seemed so vague, so uncertain, that if I hadn't been absolutely sure it wasn't my own handwriting, I would have said it was somebody else's. The bits and pieces were there, and when finally Hurrah stopped coming, I started to piece together what looked to me like a big jigsaw puzzle. This lasted for almost an entire year, in which time Dorothy wrote over 70 pages of fractured hieroglyphic text. 
For the whole period, she had kept the few fragments that she had picked up from Hora and that she could make sense of a secret from her husband, Imam, who had grown increasingly concerned about his new wife's behaviour. With Hora's tale complete, however, Dorothy worked on translating, and with every new segment she would transcribe, the story of her past life became ever more clear. After almost 30 years, she finally begun to understand the meaning behind all of her strange dreams, all of the tears she had shed as a child, and all of those frustrating years she had spent grasping for answers in the dark. <laughs>